Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Slave Dwelling Project Conference. Um, I'm happy to introduce Tom Shook and his talented panel. Um, they're going to be discussing New London, Connecticut, telling the half that's never been told. So we're so excited to have them. So Tom, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Emma. Uh, let me just go. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to assume that the screen is uh, visible to everyone here. Can somebody just give me a little feedback so that you can read that? Nicole or hello? Yeah, it's, we're fine. Okay, all right, very good. All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are very pleased and excited to be able to present this program. This is a, 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 a program that we've been working on for a couple of years in the making. Uh, we have created a Black Heritage walking trail in New London, Connecticut, and it's telling the half that's never been told. Okay, New London history, it's, New London is, just, is a very historic city, dates back to 1646, but its history has always consisted of basically Nathan Hale, a Revolutionary War hero, Benedict Arnold, uh, uh, who burned New London, and the whaling industry. Uh, New London at one time was uh, the second largest uh, whaling city on the uh, in America. Uh, they left out some historic, uh, significant events like this. Uh, New London, Connecticut in 1717 passed a referendum that prohibited uh, blacks from owning or living in the town of New London. That's something that's never been talked about in New London. Well, here we are 300 years later, and this is New London City Council today. As you can see, we've changed. Uh, the, the City Council has a, a majority of uh, people of color and women. So there's been a big change over the 300 years. One of those big changes has occurred as, as a result and in connection with the George Floyd murder uh, a, a year ago, and that has uh, given the impetus for even more change. So one of the things that we want to do is that we want to change some of that narrative, some of that history that's been left out. We want to talk about it. Uh, we want to preserve it for our children and, and, and future generations. So we, we created this Black Heritage Trail. We want to, first of all, it was a collaborative effort, and we want to thank uh, Mayor Michael Passero and the New London City Council, who uh, helped to uh, fund this and approve it and, and, and got it, the program moving. We have a panel today of the people, many of the people who worked on this program, starting with uh, Kurt, Mr. Curtis Goodwin. Uh, he is a New London City Councilor. He has been the inspired leadership and energy that made this project happen, and we'll talk with him in a minute. Uh, Laura Natush is the executive director of New London Landmarks, which is a historic preservation group in New London, and she's been the uh, the uh, interface between the city and the people who are doing the work. Uh, and she brought in a group of researchers that did the, the research on each of these sites on the on the project. Nicole Thomas, Monty Braxton the uh, second, Laura herself, and, and myself. Uh, Nicole is a uh, Let's see, Nicole is a pure historian, uh, and she uh, she does this because she loves it. She works in the social service industry, uh, and she is also an interpreter at the Hempstead Houses, which is one of the sites in, in here. Uh, and I think that she has another reason for doing this, which kind of epitomizes what we embodies the reason that we're doing this. She has two daughters, and she wants her daughters to grow up learning the true history uh, of New London uh, and to understand it better than we were taught. So Nicole is an important part of that. Lonnie Braxton is a, uh, uh, an attorney for the state of Connecticut in the juvenile court. He was born in Mississippi, grew up in Jim Crow America, and he brings his unique wisdom and philosophy. He's, uh, he's our group philosopher uh, and keeps us on track in terms of uh, being true to the story. Laura is a dedicated uh, uh, organizational uh, gifted person who has uh, been uh, responsible for keeping us all on track. Her, she has been the interface between the city and the people doing the working, uh, the doing the research. And she uh, she's an exceptional editor uh, and giving us feedback and keeping us on track and on our timelines, because this was a timeline and deadline uh, situation. OK, so those are the folks uh, who, who are doing this. Where did this come from? We didn't start out uh, with the intention of creating a Black Heritage Trail. 
this all started a couple of years ago. I stumbled on a story. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a retired guy. I worked in social services. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a history buff, and I'm uh, a Sherlock Holmes fan. I came across a story of a guy named Ichabod Pease a couple of years ago, uh, an 81-year-old man who started a school for black children in New London. As a New London native, I had never heard this before, and I thought, what is, what is this all about? How come I don't know the story? So I started researching it, and uh, it, it became such a I, th I thought it was such an important story that I got together with uh, Laura Natush from the New London Landmarks, and we thought, that, let's see if we can find a way to to commemorate Mr. Pease for uh, standing up in a time of turbulence. This is at a time when the, uh, the, co the country was in turmoil over the abolition of slavery and education of blacks and black suffrage. And, and, and this 81-year-old man stood up and, and started a school for children. So he needed to be commemorated. So uh, Laura helped uh, put on a, uh, a presentation and it was a fundraiser to restore uh, Ichabod Pease's grave and his wife. And it was an outstanding success. We got a huge crowd that night. That's myself on the left. Mary Lycan was my co-presenter. If you look in the center of the picture, looking right at the camera is Nicole Thomas. And what you can't see is off to the right was Lonnie Braxton, by coincidence, in the front row. Uh, and Laura Natush is in the back of the audience. And Curtis Goodwin, who is someone I had not known, uh, was in the audience also off to the right. Now, it turned out that, I mean, my fondest dream was that we, would, we, we were able to restore Mr. Pease's grave, but uh, I was hoping for more. And I was hoping that somehow, somewhere, more could be done. Well, my prayers were answered because Mr. Curtis Goodwin was in the audience. And, uh, and I'm going to turn, turn it over to you, Curtis, uh, to maybe tell us uh, what, what this meant to you and, and why you did what you did. Because without you, we would not have what we have here today. Are you uh, there? Thank, yes. Thank you, Tom. You're too kind. Thank you. Thank everyone for being here. Thank the presenters who have put on this phenomenal conference for having us here today. You know, as Tom said, he put on this fabulous um, moramium uh, about Ichabod Pease. And excuse me, I'm a little overwhelmed because in my wildest dreams, I never thought we'd be here presenting in a national conference, let alone sharing these stories of resilience, of hope, of inspiration. But, you know, here we are today and I'm just honored to be here um, presenting. So when Tom did this presentation, just to rewind a little bit, Nicole Thomas was planting seeds in me about black history, about history, about the city of New London, about me, you know, relishing in my identity and understanding who I am and, and teaching black history and the culture. We would take frequent visits uh, to City Hall and, and to the New London, um, excuse me, the City Hall to look at uh, the vaults and share stories of, of black history. And I was just immersed and, and mesmerized by these stories that I didn't grow up learning. I didn't grow up in public school system understanding anything other than slavery. You know, the whippings, the lashings, the hangings. And lo and behold, right here in the city, we had an abundance of black history and stories of resilience. So we fast forward and I attend this uh, conference or, or this seminar that Mr. Shook put on. And something about Igabog Pease and his story just resonated and planted further seeds in me. It, this idea that at 81, you still had that level of resilience and tenacity to start a school for black children here in the city of New London. It taught me a lot of things of not only about the resilience of my ancestors, who I believe firmly believe I stand on the shoulders of, but, you know, about myself. And uh, I like to refer to, you know, my brothers and sisters as kings and queens and to better understand what it is we can do and in, 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 in building hope and building community for ourselves. So as he's, you know, going through the legacy of Ichabod Pease, and I will say the legacy and not just his story, I'm starting to compare it to myself. At this point in time, I'm, I'm about to embark on one of the scariest times in my life to run for public office. And for some of you guys, if you guys don't know, it's a very thankless job and it's super tough being a black male um, running for city office. And here I am and how fortunate am I to learn about a man who at 81 did something that was bigger than himself, did something for children, and as I'm sitting here floating through my mind, how is it that I'm gonna do this? How is it, how am I gonna feel? How am I gonna feel? I thought about this slave, this slave who had to purchase his freedom twice and at 81 started the school. And at no time could you be 81 years old and think, I, 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 it was not a selfish act. 
It was an act that was going to go on for future generations to come. It was literally in that moment that I sat here and said, not only am I going to run for city office, I'm going to do so with the most unapologetic attitude. I'm going to be relentless and I'm going to be unwavering in what it is I'm going to do for future generations to come. And literally at that moment, you know, the light bulb went off and I said, this is what I was meant to do. This was the path that the creator put in front of me. And I'm going to act with that same tenacity that Ichabod Peace instilled in me. And hopefully I can spark or encourage hope in youth and the rest of New London and, and now the rest of the world to understand that, you know, we're more than what the history books uh, said about us. This project for me is literally about not necessarily rewriting history, but telling history from our eyes. Typically, history is told by those that don't look like me. And now we have a chance to tell history from an inclusive nature and with people of color at the table leading that story. So I'm encouraged. I'm proud. I'm excited to have attended uh, that presentation that you did, Tom. And I hope what I got out of Tom's presentation, the rest of you all tuning in, get out of our presentation with regards to what you can go back and do within your community to instill hope, to be inclusive, to act with intention and purpose. And you just never know what's going to sprout from one seed being planted. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, what, what I want to do, uh, I appreciate all of your comments, and, and, and uh, I, I'm, it's a heartfelt thing to, to hear you say those things. Thank you. Uh, what I want to do now is just do kind of run through the mechanics uh, step by step of how we did what we did, and then we're going to talk about what it is that we did. So uh, forgive me for I'm going to I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. There are a series of steps. If someone is interested in doing something like this, uh, you can contact us and I can send you the step by step process. And of course, it'll be different for you, but it may be helpful for you to see uh, how we uh, put this collaborative effort together. Uh, shortly after uh, Curtis was elected. Uh, he became chairman of the Economic Development Council. Mr. Felix Reyes was the director of economic development for the city of New London. Those two guys got together. And at that moment, Felix happened to be applying for a grant for uh, the Eastern Regional Tourism uh, District. And he, uh, he and Curtis talked about doing a program like this. And he was able to include this uh, money for this trail in that grant, which was granted. Okay. That was, the, that was the first thing. The next step was uh, they contacted Laura Natush, uh, who uh, was responsible for recruiting people to do the, the grunt work, for doing the research and, the, and the, the writing of all of this. That was the next step. Okay. Again, this was a collaborative effort. We had elected officials. We had city administrative officials. We had funding sources. The city of New London funded the part of this and the Eastern Regional Tourism Board funded this. The, the historic preservation and the person of Laura Natush was, was involved here. We had people from the community that were out doing the writing and the marketing and technical development was done by a, a contractor named Quinn and Harry, who uh, does work for the city of New London. They did the, the, the hard the technical stuff. And then, of course, we also had the, the folks that go, went out there and actually put the plaques and the posts in place. So it was a, a real community team effort. And this is what we created the New London Black Heritage Trail. That's two of the sites in the background, Shiloh Baptist Church and the Hempstead Houses. Here's the timeline. Uh, this That uh, Ichabod Peace uh, presentation was in 2019. Uh, we uh, initiated the uh, group collaborative effort around September 2020, and we brought it to fruition as we speak. They The plaques went in this past week. The official unveiling is next scheduled for next Thursday, where we're going to uh, officially uh, introduce it to the, the population in London. Okay, the first step was, uh, the next step, I should say, was uh, selecting the sites. We have many sites. New London has a rich history uh, going back, you know, 400 years. And uh, so we had to narrow it down to, given the time frame that we had, given the amount of money that we had, we had to select some sites. So we initially had a list of about 25, and we narrowed it down to 15 that were doable. Okay, what were those stories? They were stories of tragedy, triumph, courage, community, resilience. Uh, they run the gamut from ancient history, uh, and I use that loosely, and right up to living history. It covers about 300 years. Ancient history being the first one, the first uh, story is from uh, 1717. The most recent story is uh, the story of a man who is still with us. He's 94 years old. 
and he is part of it. And in fact, our, our unveiling is going to take place at his house, at his home, where, the, where one of the plaques is, has been erected. Okay, now here's the, here's the, the work that had to be done. We had to develop a, a, the plaque. Now, the plaque has to be able to tell the story in about 150 words. Uh, we want to engage people. Uh, we can't tell the whole story in 150 words, uh, so we've got to edit it and narrow it down. So this was a series of, of meetings. Uh, uh, this is, of course, happening, by the way, during the COVID. So all of our meetings were on Zoom, and uh, it was uh, Laura, uh, who was generally the chair, and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the mother hen, if I can use that, to make sure we stayed on task and, and kept to our deadlines. And then we would uh, submit text, rewrite it, peer review and all that, take it back, rewrite it and do it again. That went on from September to February. At the end of February, we submitted the 15 plaques to the city of New London and they ordered the plaques. OK, this is what the plaque, the original plaque looked like. This is for Ichabod Pease. This was the first one that we had done. Uh, it was later revised to include the seal of the city of New London and the Black Heritage Trail. This is what they all look like now. And again, it's a short 150 words to tell the basics of, of uh, why this person or why this site, what, what's important uh, to know. Uh, now, we know that we can't tell the whole story uh, on 150 words. So uh, we did, they're going to, they will be including QR codes. I didn't know what a QR code was, uh, but this is going to be attached to the plaque where you hold up your smartphone and your smartphone will link you to a website. And the website uh, will, be, will contain web uh, page text. Uh, it'll be more like a, a thousand to fifteen hundred words and it will include images. Uh, and again, we did the same process. We sit down, we write, we were signed, we write the thing, we submit it. Everybody talks about it. We review it, take it back, do it again bring it back, take it back, do it again. Uh, so it's a lot of work. And we were doing this on a, basically on a, almost a weekly basis from February to June 2021. Uh, and at, at the end of June, we submitted the, the web pages to the Quinn and Harry group uh, who were responsible for making it look good. Uh, we, did the, we did the content and they make it look good. This is one of the websites. Uh, this is the Hempstead house that Nicole Thomas uh, worked on. Uh, that's the house up there in the, in the left. Uh, the uh, picture on the lower on the lower left is the room in the house where an enslaved man named Adam Jackson lived. OK, the the uh, the image on the right uh, is an image from uh, the owner of that house was a guy named Joshua Hempstead. And he kept a diary for 47 years. And a lot of the information that we learned about Adam Jackson is contained in that in that diary. Uh, now the, the next step was the implementation. We got, we got to put the, figure out where to put these markers. Okay. A lot of things to think about. Here's an example. This is the hotel Bristol, the scene of a race riot during the red summer of 1919 that nobody in new London knew about. Okay. But we've got to put, figure out a place to put it. We can't block traffic. We can't block the pedestrian access. We got to have a uh, wheelchair access. Uh, if you put it on the sidewalk and because we're in new England, we got to be concerned about snow removal. So we gave these the, uh, the we recommended several options to the people who were actually going to install them. Uh, some of them were complicated, like this one. Here's another one. The building on the right is the subject building, uh, but this is a one way street, and everybody knows it's so narrow. Trucks drive down the sidewalk on the other side, so we can't put a plaque on the right hand side. It ended up being over on the, uh, on the left hand side of the street uh, as, as, because of those considerations. OK, on the other hand, we had some that were very simple. This this is a, the Robert Jackman plot that happens to be a, a city owned public park, which is an ideal uh, place in a lot of ways because there's a lot of uh, people there, kids, children, families. It also happens to be near a, a bus stop, a school bus stop and maybe a public bus stop. But anyway, it was very easy to pick. We could put it wherever we wanted to because the, the city owned the whole place. Most of them were more, more challenging than this. And I'll explain that little comment at the bottom a little later on. Okay, then the actual marker installation, that was another process. This is where, where we deal with the guys who know what they're doing. We're just making suggestions. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, the, the people who actually do the work uh, come out and, and uh, do the final uh, setting. We had to, uh, as a result of that, uh, all of the plaques with one exception 
are actually on public property. They're on the, the sidewalk uh, that's owned by the city of New London. They can do what they want there. And uh, we didn't have to deal with any kind of uh, you know private property, getting permission from the owner or anything like that. With one exception, and that will be Spencer Lancaster we, that you'll hear about, uh, they wanted the prop they wanted the plaque to be on the, the property that they that they owned. So they were accommodated in that. Okay. Again, that's the, the nitty gritty of what we had to do, the process part of it. And, and, I, and I'm done with that. And if anyone is interested uh, in, in getting the sequence uh, or the, the process of how we did that, please, uh, there'll be an email uh, available to you. You can shoot me an email and I'll send you the list. Again, your situation would, would probably be different, uh, but it may be helpful to see the kinds of things that we went through to, uh, to accomplish it. Now I'd like to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the uh, the sites themselves. Okay, uh, Robert Jacklin. This was the earliest site that we had in 1716-17. Uh, uh, he was an emancipated slave. He uh, came to New London from Massachusetts and he wanted to buy some property. Uh, there was tremendous resistance in the city against him. And they had a public meeting and they took a, a vote and they voted uh, to oppose uh, anyone of his, uh, a person of that color, as you can see in the text, uh, have any possessions or free gold estate within this government. They also sent that to the colony government in Hartford and requested that they make it uh, a law for the state. Now that was never fully implemented, uh, but there were many towns in Connecticut that did have a similar ordinance. And again, people think that, well, wait a minute, all, Problems like this, this is stuff that existed in the South. No, this was all over the country. This, this happened in New London. Right? People in New London did not know about this, okay? Uh, interestingly enough, I tracked down the, uh, I did some research into the, the, uh, the, the property itself, uh, which was, by the way, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but uh, the day that, the, uh, that Robert Jacklin purchased the property, uh, Joshua Hempstead, who is also part of this story today, was uh, considered what, would, what we would call now like the first selectman. They called him a townsman, and he was the representative of the community. He went in his official capacity to the seller of the land and cautioned him against selling his land to Robert Jacklin. He did that officially and so officially that he entered it into the property records uh, book, and you can see his signature at the, uh, in the middle of the page there. Uh, he made it as an official caution against uh, selling the property. So he was, he was in the lead of this. Okay. Ironically, uh, to when I tried to find that property, uh, if, if you've done, and again, this is something you'll run into if you do this kind of research, uh, going back to 1716, uh, New London's property records go back to 1646. But in those days, there were no street names, okay? The property lines, property designations were uh, the corner of the stone wall next to the walnut tree by the heap of stones on the highway. And uh, that could be anywhere. You end up having to look at all of the uh, surrounding properties and try to trace it down. It's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. So I had done that and I had figured where I thought it was. And then one night I had a conversation uh, with uh, Nicole Thomas and she talked about Joshua Hempstead's diary and you know what kind of things could, that could contain. So I started looking a couple of things up and I, I looked up a, a one of the one of the projects that actually Nicole was working on. And then I just kept kind of turning the pages, telling myself I should go to bed. OK, turn the pages. And all of a sudden, Joshua Hempstead is measuring the distance from one of his properties to the other. He's giving mile markers along the way as he's as he's doing this. And he's accompanied by Adam Jackson, who is his enslaved man. OK, and they mention at the one mile marker, they mention the property that they don't mention Robert Jacklin's name, but they mention the property that Robert Jacklin sold to a, a guy named Joseph Talman. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is it. This is where it's exactly where I thought it was. It's that little park that you saw earlier. It's in a hollow. And uh, and it was it was just amazing to me that uh, I should be able to confirm the location of that property thanks to a 300-year-old diary from Joshua Hempstead working with Adam Jackson. It was like, a, it was 
remarkable. Uh, it goes beyond my comprehension. Okay, uh, speaking of Adam Jackson, uh, Adam is uh, one of the, uh, also a part of the, this uh, uh, marker plaque uh, trail. And uh, the research on this was done by uh, Nicole Jackson. <laughs> Nicole Jackson. <laughs> Nicole Thomas. It's Adam Jackson. Sorry. Uh, Nicole, uh, you're with us now. And uh, I would like Nicole to have a few minutes to maybe tell us, uh, you know, uh, why is this why is this important? What uh, what's the story here? What can you tell us about that? Are you there, Nicole? Yes, Tom, I am here. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nicole Thomas and I haven't researched enough, so I could be a Jackson. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> who knows? All these stories are out there. So um, Adam Jackson, his story is really absolutely amazing. But we get the majority of Adam's story from Joshua's diary, um, the diary he kept for 47 years, starting in 1711. And you know, you hear a lot from the enslaver's perspective, of course, from Joshua. We work in that house, excuse me, that's um, from 1670, it has that foundation and has, you know, quite a story to it. But Adam, um, his family, we have so much about Adam based on the books you see here on the screen, just from Joshua's diary. And then a woman named Allegra de Bonaventura came to our homes um, prior to me working there to find out more about Joshua Hempstead himself. She had no idea about Adam. Um, and she, she didn't know who Adam was. And as she's researching this stuff, um, because Joshua's wife had passed pretty young and um, she's researching. And so she starts seeing this name, Adam, Adam, Adam. And she thinks he's maybe possibly family or something. Um, and before you know it, we have a binder at the house that contains all the times that this man is mentioned. Well, she finds that he was purchased by um, Joshua Hempstead in 1727. Adam had been born around 1700 and his mother, Joan Jackson, was enslaved, you know, in another part of New London. And his father, John Jackson, had been a free man. He came over here from the West Indies in the um, about 1686. And by 1700, he had gained his freedom. So John Jackson, having been enslaved to that Rogers family, he buy, gets his freedom. And eventually there's this landmark court case because they go out and they kidnapped Joan Jackson back. It's really a, a long story, but it's so worth telling. I really encourage um, for Adam's sake, I do. Um, so they go and they do that. They they kidnap Joan and they bring her back. And so there's this court battle um, between a lot of the families here locally, just trying to figure out if Adam or Joan rather should have her freedom. And so that's where we get a lot from it. And in Joshua's diary, you hear a lot about Adam Jackson working with um, Joshua and working with Joshua's grandsons, but you don't get to hear very much from Adam himself. The one thing you do hear, and of course relayed by Joshua Hempstead, because Adam doesn't speak for himself, um, Adam lays out in the court case that John and Joan Jackson are his parents. So at that point, you get a part of his legacy, you get kind of who he is, where he comes from. And one of the most common questions I think I get when people come to the house is, why didn't Adam run away? His family was enslaved really not far from him, so there wouldn't have been anywhere for him to go. And we can speculate on that for really forever. But um, I think there's just more work to be done for Adam. Um, there's so much more to be said about him, and I'd like to hear some of these other stories. So I, I would love for you guys to um, pick up some of these books, do some research, and really just learn more about him. But it's really, really important because Adam was a part of that home. Adam was a part of that place. And um, there, he stands to teach us quite a bit. And his family gave us so much to look after. So those court case records are out there and they're pretty, pretty important. So thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you, Nicole. And the thing that always strikes me about that is that this is another resource. Uh, it's very difficult to trace the stories of the enslaved people. But in this case, we have a really, I think it's a 30 year record of court cases where they are fighting back and forth to establish the freedom of the members of the family and, and some of the children are free and some of the children are enslaved. And it gives us a, a, a really good picture of what life was like to be enslaved in, in the North, in New London. Uh, and it's all in the court records. It's not some place that maybe you, you might first uh, think about, uh, but it's worth noting. Okay, again, here is the, uh, this is the webpage that Nicole developed. That's the house. That's the garret where uh, uh, Adam lived. And there's a picture of the diary. What I should say is give us a little shout out to Joe McGill because Joe McGill comes to New London and this is where he stays. You may recognize that garret. It's the same garret 
Uh, in this case, Joe is uh, uh, is meeting with a group of, uh, I think they're middle school kids, and talking about the slave dwelling project. So uh, he, he has been to this, he's very familiar with uh, with this program there. Now, he, this is another one that's that's very interesting, and, and very little is known about it. And, and what little is known about it is oftentimes uh, misinterpreted. And, and again, Nicole, I'm going to ask Nicole to, can you tell us, what can you tell us about that? What does the audience need to know about uh, Florio Hercules and the governor of the Negroes? Yeah, so this, this one is actually really important. And this is one of those stories that gets told, um, you know, locally here and there. And, and thankfully, some of this information had already been out there. Um, so we know what we know about Hercules himself just based on the gravestone of his wife and and she passes away in 1749 um but we know the office of the black governors had been started up in lynn massachusetts around the 1740s and so when you look at historic texts from connecticut you know you see that in 1755 1750 that um there were black governors elected in hartford connecticut you know london being the first on historic record you hear about Samuel Huntington up in Norwich, people that had, you know, been featured in, in historic texts, but Hercules, his the gravestone of his wife, which you see on the screen there, um, just really kind of predates all of that. And it really just gives credit to the fact that New London had that black governor um, prior to, and a lot of people just tend to think that this was um, not really an important office. They think that it was kind of a sham. Francis Marin Calkins called it um, a sham, you know, dignity and, just referring to a lot of the things that had come before them so it was a lot of that society that was looking at these people thinking that they weren't of any means you know um they had been enslaved of course and we don't have much of a background on hercules himself most of what we have is based on this gravestone and other things had been um researched but his wife florio had been earned um excuse me owned by a local family the hallams and you hear again joshua Hempstead comes right back into play here you hear a lot in Joshua's diary um, there mentioned when um, Hercules' kids end up passing away and then his wife and his daughter, Judith, Florio and Judith are disposed of. Um, so that's, you know, what you hear the, the most. But when you hear about, you don't hear a lot about the other stories when they went up against the general assemblies and legislatures and things about being taxed without representation. They went and they were really strong orators. They would have had to been publicly you know, liked by their communities, the black communities themselves. So there's a lot really to tell about the black governors. And I hope um, people here just get into those stories and start to explore those. Now I'll turn it back over to Tom. Okay. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Yeah. That, and, and that's what I was talking about the, with the misinterpretation that society, uh, white society generally diminishes the importance. Uh, but I know you discovered that, uh, that several of these governors of the Negroes were very active in the uh, petitions to the legislature fighting for black suffrage. Uh, the Connecticut legislature eliminated the right to vote for blacks uh, in 1818. And, and uh, there were 30 petitions filed by, uh, by black uh, citizens of, of Connecticut between 1818 and 1860 uh, petitioning for black suffrage and every single one of them was denied by the legislature. Blacks did not get the right to vote in Connecticut until after the Civil War when they passed, I think it's the 15th Amendment, 1869, 1870. Uh, people don't know that. Uh, and, and, and these guys were, were some of the leaders of, of that movement. Uh, and this is where she's buried, by the way. Uh, she, uh, we know her burial ground. What about Hercules, uh, Nicole? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, like many of the people that were enslaved, Adam Jackson included, they were separated in life as an, in, you know, same as in death. Um, nobody really knows where, Her we don't even know who Hercules was enslaved to, unfortunately. So again, that begs um, the fact that there's more research to be done there. And so the um, the NAACP, some of the historians, people like that, had gone and, and looked at the back of that ancientest burial ground and pulled out some of those um you know, those gravestones and those grave sites. And there are people there that, that are probably buried there that we'll never know about. So we don't know exactly when Hercules died. We don't know where he's buried. And you have to think about that. You know, people were separated from their families. And again, that's why I think, um, you know, Adam Jackson may have remained and, and not have taken off from Joshua Hempstead because that's what he knew. That's who was there. 
So we don't we don't know, unfortunately, where Hercules is. And um, that's the case for a lot of enslaved people, unfortunately. So we're hoping to be able to look forward and, and uncover some of those stories as well. Yeah, I just want to I want to throw this out. You know, we have uh, we have put in place 15 markers and this is not to be considered the end or the goal. This is really just the beginning because some of these stories are being heard for the first time. And we're we're hopeful that other people will will take an interest in this. And, and there may be more information out there on Hercules, maybe in somebody's diary or, you know, privately held letters and stuff like that, that we just don't know about. And maybe this will be an impetus so that we can discover more about it. Okay, thank you, uh, Nicole. Uh, now I'd like to bring in Laura Natush. Uh, how are you, Laura? I'm doing great, and I'm so happy to be here and, and honored to be part of this. Um, so I'd like to talk about Anton de Sant. Now we are moving chronologically forward, and now we're into the 19th century. And as we tried to do with most of these sites, we tried to focus on both a local history, but then tie it into a larger either national or, in the case of Anton de Sant, international story. So here's a photograph of Anton de Sant. Um, as you can see, he's... Um, sometimes spelled Antoine de Saint, this, um, his spelling of his name wasn't standardized. He is born in what's now known as Cabo Verde. Um, you might all be more familiar with it as Cape Verdean Islands, or Cape Verde, um, in around 1815. Now, Cape, Cabo Verde was not very hospitable for human life and it was uninhabited until the Portuguese colonized it in the mid 15th century. It had a lot of drought. Um, there were no bodies of standing fresh water. Um, not a great place to live, but because of where it was located, it turned out to be a great cent center for the transatlantic slave trade. So although Anton de Sant was never enslaved, his biography does tie into the transatlantic slave trade because he never would have been there if, if it hadn't existed. Um, in the, seven, in the 1770s, Cabo Verde suffered a tremendous drought that killed about 50% of its population. In the 1830s, from 1830 to 1833, they suffered another tremendous drought that killed about 30% of their population, 30,000 people. It was at the beginning of this drought in the eight, that began 1830 that Descent comes to New London um, on board a whaling vessel. Um, and you can, and he was only 15 or 16 years old at the time, leaving everything behind and coming to a new world where maybe there wouldn't be such drought, maybe there wouldn't be such poverty. He's staking his life on this. Um, and when he did so, he was part of a wave of people from Cabo Verde that was coming to New London. And these are the earliest people who are African who emigrate to the United States voluntarily. So that's a big part of his story. Um, when he gets here, now Tom Shook had talked earlier in this presentation about New London being a whaling town. This was the beginning of the height of New London building its wealth with the whaling industry. And, you know, for decades, people have been hearing in New London about how we were a historic whaling town. Um, we at New London Landmarks put up plaques with whales on them to mark historic houses. And, and much of downtown New London and um, the wealthier neighborhoods were built with whaling money. But what we had not ever talked about until recently was that at least 10% of the 19th century whaling crews coming out of New London were people of color. Um, and so Dessant is part of that story. And he, coming to New London, you know, whaling was a hard life. Um, people of color were twice as likely as white people to serve on crews of whaling ships. Um, being sent to be a crew member on a whaling ship was sometimes a form of punishment for white youth um, who had angered their parents. But for a black man like Dessant, it provided opportunities that he would not have been able to find in other, um, in other occupations. And so it, can you go forward a little bit? But you can actually see from this that he's, he's prosperous, he's proud. Um, I, I just love how he presents himself in this portrait. Okay, go forward. Um, he shows up in 1831, but by, nine, by 1840, he has accrued enough wealth as a whaler 
to purchase these properties, which are on the outskirts of New London's downtown. Um, I think most people in New London are very fond of the building that you see on the left and in the foreground on the right because of that curved wall. I know I was always curious about this building. That curve is because Truman's Brook used to run right alongside that building and the curve of the wall follows the curve in Truman's Brook. That brook is now running underground. Um, Desant not only accrued wealth as a whaler, but then he leveraged that wealth to, to purchase these buildings, to purchase buildings on, in several other streets in New London, and to open businesses. He ran a barber shop and he also ran a grocery store when he wasn't at sea. Um, and he was able to pass these buildings down to his family. Um, his daughter, Julia, lived there. It, it remained in the family for close to a century. I'm sorry, over a century, right, Tom? Uh, yes. I, yes. I think until the 1990s, late 1990s. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so, so we wanted to be able to show his contribution to New London's overall wealth, but then show, you know, this he was able to build a good life for him and his family as a whaler in New London. And the whaling industry helped make New London the diverse community that it remains today. That is also the case in New Bedford too, which has a really large population from Cabo Verde because of their whaling industry. Okay. Okay. I, I, I just want to say, uh, I, I grew up in New London and uh, I walked to school and I used to walk by this building every day for uh, eight years. And I was always fascinated by it. I had no idea why it was shaped like that. We call this the boat building. And to discover that it was actually connected to uh, the a whaler, and in this case, a black whaler, it's, it's such a historic building. It's just, uh, it's just fascinating to me. He did all of both of those buildings. Both of those about this. We first began researching this building about three years ago because there was a developer who wanted to purchase these houses and all the surrounding properties and build some kind of big box store there. The owner of these of these two buildings, the current owner, did not sell and that caused that whole development project to fall through. These buildings are not listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, in Connecticut, if you are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, your property is protected from demolition. It's considered a resource in which the public has a trust, just like clean air and clean water. Connecticut values its historic buildings, but it has not always valued the historic buildings that are tied to black culture and black heritage. And so we are hoping to get these buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places with the full support of its current owner so that these buildings can be nationally recognized and protected as they should be. We support that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay. I want to switch over to uh, uh, Lonnie Braxton. Uh, Lonnie, uh, this is one of the stories that is, uh, I grew up in New London. I never heard this. I never heard this story. It's uh, virtually unknown. And I'd have to say maybe a suppressed story. Uh, what can you share with us uh, about the Hotel Bristol? Well, I'd like to say thanks to uh, everyone, especially thanks to uh, Mr. Goodwin, uh, you and uh, Laura for not only uh, keeping the fire of this whole thing burning, but for actually sharing my uh, my real hobby. You know, I was a, a as a kid, I was always a geek and always loved history. And my parents were my father was almost forty when I was born, so I had an opportunity to be around in the presence of a lot of older people and I always had questions. So growing up in Mississippi and moving to Connecticut. Uh, I got here and I thought something in Mississippi was old because it was 50 years old. You know, getting to uh, New London, finding out it's not old unless it's 200, 250, 300 years old. It was quite a marvel. So I uh, like to read and I read a book and the book was called Red Summer. And in Red Summer, when I read this book, I came across New London, Connecticut. And I've lived here since 1968. No idea. But I had read an awful lot about 1919. They had the Russian Civil War. The Tsar and his family were assassinated. But Bino Mussolini, he actually formed the, the uh, fascist party in Italy the same year. Uh, in China, they had the May 4th movement. Uh, prohibition started in the United States. So all of these things were going on and knew nothing about 
the summer of 1919 involving people of color, other than once in a while, I read a snippet about how many riots had taken place. And there were, that summer, there were over a hundred documented lynchings in America, because remember, World War I had basically just ended. We have all these people returning back who have been fighting in Europe, fighting for freedom, fighting for a, a better way of life for the world, only to face discrimination at home. And a lot of these men and women were not going to stand for it. So they were standing up. And as they stood up, they were standing up at what I found for three things. One was self-defense when the riots and the unrest took place. The other one was a battle for truth. And the last one was, was for justice. Now you say self-defense, neighborhoods were being attacked. People were being chased out of their own neighborhoods. Their property was being destroyed. Remember, 1919, 1920, 1921, Tulsa. So this whole movement that was taking place throughout the world uh, was impacting black people in a very serious way. So they were going, there were black men who had been soldiers, some were doctors, some were lawyers, and all these towns, they were putting together these defense forces to protect themselves. And the truth that was being printed in the press all too often said they were the aggressors. So they were fighting to have this actually addressed. And for justice, they wanted to make sure that they lost their property. If someone was arrested or jailed, what have you, that they were going to get justice. So when I read about the Bristol Hotel, I am Hotel Bristol, I'm trying to figure out where is this place? And as you, Tom, had walked by that building on Bank Street year after year, I had done the same for the Hotel Bristol, driven by it, looked at it. Robert's Electronics was close by, gone in, and never knew. So I started to do a bit of research. And researching this, I found out that things hadn't really changed that much in 100 years. Because as they were suffering or, or suffering or searching for the truth, or suffering from the lack of the truth, the truth about this alleged riot wasn't even true. Because when you read about it, and some of the newspapers said, oh, Black sailors had attacked these white sailors. Well, as we looked and, and started to read some clippings, I had a friend in DC to actually go to an archive and send me some additional clippings and an investigation had been done. And during the, uh, this investigation, it was found that the black sailors had been maligned, attacked, and really kind of bullied for months. And, Complaints have been made and what have you. And as a result of an incident that the press claimed that they that white sailors were attacked or ambushed when really it was not the case. So when I started reading all of the reports that I could come up with, and I read the couple that were in New London, it was amazing how much was left out, how much wasn't talked about. And the great thing about this site is that there were 5,000 people surrounding this place. They called out all of the Marines from the sub base. They called out the police. They called out the fire department. New London was basically in a police state for that night. And yet, we didn't hear about it. And the great thing about this project that's so heartwarming is that it's not only telling Black history, it's telling American history, that history that people I guess if it's your norm only to hear one part and you hear this new thing, it could cause you a little bit of unrest. But history is still something that happened. And the things that we're talking about during this conference are all things that happened. And what we are actually doing is no longer making it his story. We're making it our story because it said, we the people, not I the people. So this this hotel and we have a plaque and you can read about it but what i want to do is get you excited to go and learn about it and this was not only the only incident like this a second incident happened and the only reason we know about that incident during the same summer is because in the mad dash 
to go and quell the situation, a truck loaded with Marines and sailors from the sub base hit a fire hydrant in New London, caused damage, and there was an argument as to who was going to pay for the damages. Was it going to be the city or was it going to be uh, the sub base? And that is the only reason that that one was mentioned. So I could, you know, being a lawyer and I will talk forever, so I'm not going to hog all the time, but I really want to tell you, go to the site, read each of the clippings, and you will get a flavor as to how pre-internet things could still be written in a certain way to give a certain kind of flavor uh, to what actually happened. And thanks, Tom. Thank Thank you, Lonnie. Yeah, and that and that's that's one of those things that uh, we, we don't. Uh, this is a hundred years ago. We don't know anything about it. I grew up. I never heard anything about this uh, all that time. So, uh, and, and it's true. It happened. It's history. Uh, we need to uh, include it in our in our history texts. Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, I'm going to switch back to uh, Laura now. This is uh, 38 Green Street. This is a different kind of a story. Uh, Laura, what should we know about 38 Green Street? So 38 Green Street is on a small side street in downtown New London. There it is. Um, there's, a, there's a photo of it. It had been vacant for quite a while. Um, you can see from the cover of Connecticut Examiner that um, a developer has bought it and is it actually now has completed microloft apartments there. Um, that developer asked us to research this property so that he could qualify for funding. Um, um, historic preservation tax credits. So the first thing I did was I went and I looked at the National Register of Historic Places, the downtown New London Historic District. Interestingly enough, the most significant history to me about this building, which is the black history that I'm about to talk about, is not even listed in the National, Re in the National Register listing. Um, and it just goes to show how, how black heritage has been overlooked um, for decades and like forever <laughs> in this country. And so we are trying to turn that around. So here you see Sadie D. Harrison and her half brother, Benjamin Tanner Johnson. And they both had offices in 38 Green Street. And actually Sadie worked in both locations. Um, she was executive secretary to, to both the, the United Negro Welfare Council and the New England People's Finance Corporation. And both of these organizations in the 1920s um, developed as uh, forms of black self-reliance self um, in the face of oppression and obstacles. Um, the, now Benjamin Tanner Johnson was the third black graduate of Harvard Business School. He graduates in 1921, and by 1922, he's writing to W.E.B. E. Du Bois saying, can you help me start a black bank? Um, can you use your, your name, your reputation, your money, whatever? whatever. Um, meanwhile, Benjamin Tanner Johnson um, moves to Canton, Ohio. He becomes secretary of, the, of Canton's Urban League, which is similar to the United Negro Welfare Council. He gets run out of town by Canton's KKK, he comes to New London in 1927 and lives with Sadie D. Harrison, his half-sister. Um, by late 1927, he has organized a regional conference about improving economic conditions for Black Americans. And at that conference, they elect a board of directors for the New England People's Finance Corporation, which Benjamin Tanner Johnson manages until 1934 in, in 38 Green Street and it is a black run lending institution. So this ties into a couple of national stories. One is that um, this was what's sometimes called the golden age of black business. Um, and you can't have black business if black business can't get credit. Um, you need credit to start a business. You need credit to purchase property. That's why Benjamin Tanner Johnson was so passionate about starting this. Um, and then, Sorry, the, the second part of the story has to do with the Great Migration. Um, and for that, I'm going to switch over to his half-sister, Sadie D. Harrison. Um, Sadie, as secretary of the United Negro Welfare Council, 
did a few things. She was um, she was a civil rights activist. She um, testified in Hartford in favor of anti-discrimination legislation. She testified in civil rights court cases. For example, there was one where a restaurateur didn't seat uh, black the black group that she was with. Um, she worked to provide housing and employment assistance for the Great Migrate, for people coming up to New London from the South as part of the Great Migration. So all of this activity does have to do with the Great Migration. Um, so if anybody is trying to find a way to tell a story in their community, and you might, you might go, well, this, this doesn't seem important if it's an early black church, if it is an early black fraternal organization, if it is an early black lending institution, it's probably related to the great migration somehow. So th these stories can have, they are gateways into large national stories. Sadie Harrison deserves to be a nationally known figure. Um, and this slide shows why Hackley and Harrison's hotel and apartment guide for colored travelers I would imagine that nearly every attendee at this conference is more familiar with a different guide for colored travelers, right? The, the Negro Motor Screen Book by Victor Green. Um, so that was published initially 36, the larger edition 37. Sadie Harrison is putting together um, in at 38 Green Street listings from 300 cities um, where black travelers can find overnight accommodations. She's doing that with um, Edwin Hackley, her, you know, a, a lawyer and poet who helped her with this. But she did the grunt work. Um, and all of those 300 listings show up in the Green Book later. So this was the precursor, not just like a little pamphlet that kind of was a precursor of the Green Book. This was really a precursor of the Green Book. Um, I don't know if it was her idea or Hackley's, but it wasn't Victor Green's. <laughs> um, and, and I'm just dumbfounded that, that I live almost right around the corner from her house on Hempstead Street, which is another one of the Black Heritage Trail sites. And I walked by that house hundreds upon hundreds of times and never knew this history. Um, and one of the things that is so meaningful to me is that um, when I explained this history to a Black man who had grown up in New London and came back briefly for a visit, um, I gave him a little impromptu tour and he said, if I had known this history, I might have never left New London. He said, I never felt connected to the place where I grew up um, because I never saw myself represented in the histories that we were taught. Um, so that's, that's what it means to tell these stories. And I want to commend Tom because he's been giving Green Book tours now um, for several years. And Sadie Harrison's own house was actually a Green Book site. Yes, where, where W.B. Du Bois stayed when he could not, when he came to New London and was not able to stay at the Mohegan Hotel and the Crocker House because they were all white at the time. This is 1929. Yeah, I agree with you. Sadie Harrison deserves uh, national recognition. Uh, she, she compiled that list of the 300 uh, cities. Uh, she didn't Google them. Uh, she wrote letters. She made phone calls. Uh, she did it the hard way, the old-fashioned way, uh, and it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, and she deserves all of our praise. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, our our final uh, uh, marker that we're going to talk about. I'm going to bring back Lonnie Braxton here. This is a, a, a very special uh, site. This is the uh, most recent marker uh, in the sense of uh, the history of that marker in that the, the man that it is dedicated to is this guy right here. Okay. This picture was taken uh, two years ago. He's 90. He was 92, just about 92 at the time. He's 94 years old. And he is an example of living history, and we are so thrilled to be able to uh, honor him with this plaque. It, this is going into his front yard, and he is going to be present uh, for the ceremony, along with his members of his family. Uh, and Lonnie is somebody who has known uh, Mr. Lancaster. He has a personal relationship with him, and this is real unusual for us to be talking about, you know, historic markers with someone an example of living history uh lonnie what should we know about uh spencer lancaster you know i was i've been for several weeks 
thinking about what would you say about him? And what I came up with at the end, he can speak for himself. I um, attended law school at UConn and there was a case we were doing. And uh, when uh, it was in constitutional law, as we're dissecting this case, the professor is making certain statements about the case. And I'm, I find myself saying, no, no, that didn't happen. And the class is quiet. It's only the professor and I going back and forth. And the last statement I made was, I'll call him and talk to him when I get home because he was still alive. <laughs> and the same thing can be done for Spencer Lancaster. I was raised by people in Mississippi who said that we walk on a road that's made of bricks and those bricks are the lives of other folks. And Spencer Lancaster is one of those bricks. A brick, have, however different, he's still with us. You know, here's a man who picketed, who protested, who served in the service of this country, who worked in New London, who was born in New London, who ran for office, who paved the way for the large number of elected officials of color we have today are a result of men because like Spencer Lancaster. And his life can be shared still. Now, I came here in 68. If I had known about the Hotel Bristol, I could have talked to people who were there. Because if they were born in 1900 or 08 or 05, they were there and still alive in 60, 70, 80, and even up into maybe 1990. We can do that with Mr. Lancaster. He is a resource. And I think that we didn't do so much for him with the plaque as we did for ourselves. Because we are giving ourselves a chance to have access to history. And you summed it up when you said living. This is living history that if we make use of it now, it's gonna last forever. So an icon, yes. A man, yes. A resource, yes. But they said about Paul Robeson being a giant in, a, in our forest of trees, he's a giant. Yes, he is. And, and, and he's a wonderful human being. He's a wonderful man to me. That smile that you see, I love this picture because that captures exactly the way I, uh, I think of him. Uh, my son took this picture at, uh, at the uh, Green Book uh, uh, a presentation that you were part of, Lonnie, a couple of years ago at the Groton Library. And it was that that was the night that I discovered uh, talking about connections and talking about living history. I found out that night that Mr. Lancaster had lived in one of the Green Book houses that I was going to feature as the Green Book in New London. He had lived there in 1954. In fact, he still had the same phone number from 1954. Not only that, his aunt was the was operating the uh, uh, one of the uh, Green Book tourist homes over on uh, on Hempstead Street, the house that was owned by Sadie Harrison. Uh, her and her husband ran that as a Green Book site. Uh, you know, a good ex a good example about him. He was a national salesman for how many times? Oh yes. Uh, and here's a man as an auto salesman at a time when uh, he was taken out of the repair shop and made a salesman but not given his own dealership. You know, so in spite of all the things, the slings, the arrows, the, the holding back uh, or less than, he continued forward. He's right. an inspiration to everybody. Yes, he is. He is the tallest tree in our forest. And he was, incidentally, and it says on the plaque, uh, Spencer Lancaster was the first a black official elected in New London. Uh, I think it was 1959 or 1960. Yes. So uh, he is the, the guy on, on whose shoulders everybody else is standing on. This is his house. That's where the plaque is going to be. And there's the plaque. It's actually, I've got this picture of it. It's, sorry, it's not not real sharp, but the one on the right, that's the plaque that's now uh, on, on site at his house that's going to be officially unveiled uh, in uh, sometime next week. Here it is here. Uh, that's his house. At the time he moved into that house, by the way, there was a petition circulated in the neighborhood 
to prevent him from moving in there. And I think that was in the 50s or 60s. Okay, uh, that summarizes uh, what we're going to talk about in terms of specific plaques. Uh, I wanted to give you a picture. This is the uh, this is the the Black Heritage Trail itself. It's a very basic map. I made this map. This is not the official one, but you can see it's a loop around the center of New London. So you can walk it. Uh, uh, it's about two miles. Uh, it does not include uh, all of the sites. A couple of them are a little bit of a distance, a few more blocks away, which would make it about a three mile uh, walk. But that, that's essentially where it's located. Uh, what's going to happen with the Black Heritage Trail? We're going to—it's going to be become part of the Connecticut Freedom Trail. Uh, it is uh, uh, adjacent to uh, connect. It will be connected to the Thames River Heritage Boat Tour, which is a historic tour that uh, visits sites on both sides of the Thames River in Groton and New London. Uh, New London already has a Central Business District uh, historic markers. Uh, series that are they're embedded in the sidewalk. Some of these are going to overlap. Uh, people are going to be able to to to, uh, to, to visit both of those things. Uh, we also have some uh, historic buildings that are included in that loop. Union Station from 1890, Nathan Hale School, which is the school where the Revolutionary War patriot uh, uh, Nathan Hale taught. That's on the walkway. It's right on the path. The U.S. Custom House and the Amistad Pier. You may recognize that because that's one of our sites. Uh, the Amistad, everyone's familiar with the Amistad. And by the way, uh, with all due respect to uh, Steven Spielberg, the Amistad, the ship, stayed in New London the entire time. It never went to New Haven like it did in the movie. It sat right down there off of Bank Street for uh, the entire uh, trial. And we also have the Shaw Mansion, which was uh, actually, it's a slave dwelling site. Uh, it, there were enslaved people living there. And it's also a place where George Washington slept uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, there are plans to integrate this into, into the life of New London also. Uh, New London is the epitome of a diverse community. This is a book that came out about uh, 30 years ago, uh, and it talks about the, the diverse uh, cultures that exist in New London. And, uh, and again, when I said uh, this is not the end point of this, this is the beginning point, we hope to be able to uh, include other groups uh, in, the, in the historic walking trail. This is the Black Heritage Trail, but there are uh, uh, new numerous other ethnicities that also need to uh, or can benefit from a, some sort of recognition, maybe similar to this. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is take a minute, a few minutes here, if we got, uh, before we close, uh, to uh, get any uh, last thoughts from uh, our panel here. Uh, it's about uh, 10 after two. So if you can limit it to just a couple of minutes, we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end. So, uh, Nicole, is there any parting thoughts that you have for us today? Can you hear me now? Yes. There you okay, go. sorry. Yes, um, definitely, definitely plenty of them. Um, you know, it's so um, many emotions wrapped into having this conversation today and to be able to sit here with everybody and really detail and listen to all these stories. You know, a lot of these stories from London came up and um, the book that Tom just showed my family is featured in that book. Um, as well as another book that was published here locally um, by Linwood Bland. And, and we will see that as well if you follow the tour. But um, a lot of those things really kind of just existed in the memories of African-Americans or black people, my family as well, um, from the Hempstead neighborhood. My mom actually grew up across the street from the Hempstead houses where I now work. Um, two words that come to mind for me are really pivotal, monumental, like these things are so important. Um, and I'm just really grateful to have been a part of this. Sometimes I get, you know, so excited and emotional when trying to talk about it, but it's laid out in the web content. So much great work went into it with all of these people. Um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm so excited to just show it. And, and while Tom was given his presentation, I had been, I have a um, 10 and 17 year old, two daughters, and I was telling them stories that Tom actually brought up as part of that presentation. And my daughters start looking at me and they're like, those stories are true. And I'm like, yeah, I've only been telling you your whole lives because, um, you know, some of the things were just held hard and fast close to home. And um, I hope you guys are able to like visit the Hempstead houses, come to New London, see these things. I hope you're you're interested and more intrigued than you were when you came into this program today. Um, I'm very, very excited, very proud. And just, I hope this is the moment where people decide if you haven't already to, um, like Tom said, this is the beginning of our journey, and I hope that we spark some kind of interest and that you'll do more research on these things. So I'm grateful, and I'll pass it along. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole.
Laura, any any part of yeah. yeah, thank you. I would say that to anybody who's listening to this and thinking about starting something like a Black Heritage Trail in your own community, but thinking this is overwhelming, I can't think of 15 sites or my God, they had the whole city behind them, which is true. We had the mayor's support, we had the wholehearted city council support. Um, you might go, maybe that's not doable in my community or where do I start? We didn't start with all of that in mind. We started following our passions and we were all just researching. And when we did, when we hosted Tom's talk by Ichabod Pease, we never dreamt that it would spark Curtis to say, I'm running for city council and I'm going to illuminate these stories and, and do something larger with this. Never would have come up with that on our own. When we began researching DeSant's house, we never thought that that would be an eventual Black Heritage Trail site. Um, we, be, we did another project recently where we actually purchased and rehabbed a house, uh, Linwood Bland Jr.'s house, um, and sold it just really just a couple months ago to a low-income home buyer. This was a house that had been Linwood Bland Jr.'s home for 40 years. He was president of the New London NAACP branch through the civil rights movement in the 1960s, an icon, an author, um, but his house was vacant and condemned um, and required so much work that it was likely to be demolished if we hadn't stepped in and done something. So I would say, follow your passions and research and trust that it will bring you somewhere. And even if you don't have the money to put up a single plaque, do the research and, and see if you can lead a tour. Do the research, see if you can talk to a high school class about it. Do the research, put together a website that's easier than putting together plaques and getting the full city support. Do what you can and see where it will take you. Um, and and if you start, if you take that one first step, you might find yourself with a whole team of supporters and helpers that you never even knew were potentially out there. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I just like to say that uh, this has been a tremendous experience for me. I. I uh, I have said this before, I think this is one of the most important things that I've done in my life. And it was such a pleasure to work with the people that I've worked with and to think about the fact that uh, we have given something uh, to the children and to the families of New London and to future generations uh, to uh, that, that, that and beyond New London. Uh, that they can learn about the, the true history of, uh, of New London and, and consequently of America. And it was a real honor to be part of it. I am so excited to see this happen. Uh, I, uh, and, I, and I'm grateful to everyone uh, for helping put it together. Curtis. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I guess I'll start with first thing, Laura, Nicole, Tom, Lonnie. I hope you guys are as proud as I am. This is truly a tremendous feat. I, I just, you know, words couldn't summarize the feelings and the emotions that I have that, you know, we're a part of living history, as uh, Lonnie was talking about earlier. Um, I guess my parting words would be much to um, Laura's point, you, you eloquently said that, or articulated it rather, you know, just take the first step, let passion lead the way you have no idea what being brave enough to take that first step where it will lead. Literally, this was me taking that first step being courageous. I had no idea in my wildest dreams that it would, you know, um, come to fruition and become as large as this has happened. And I, I guess I'll share some next steps of where we're going with, you know, the city of New London and history and, you know, what we can do with this energy. We plan to start an indigenous trail next um, and tell the untold stories of our indigenous peoples here in the city of New London and southeastern Connecticut. They intertwine so beautifully. Um, and we'd be remiss not to tell that story. And also on a council level, I mean, I'm so proud and I get overwhelmed to, and I guess sharing this, you know, firsthand, haven't even got to indulge too much with my own public here in the New London. We're actually honored and in a position of privilege to start to embark on going back into redlining and, and what that did and ripped apart for the city of New London, our black residents, and to be able to reconcile with those residents and put in the research and, and not just reconcile in the way of saying, you know, sorry, but actual 
you know, reparations and, and or providing housing, providing stability, financial literacy, and actually being able to put in the money and the research to reconcile well, what happened in, in terms of racism, redlining. And, and for me, it just, it's truly full circle and never in a million years did I think we'd be able to come here. But literally all it takes is taking that first step and following passion. You just never know where it can lead. So, you know, thank you to everyone who's on this panel and thank you to everyone who's listening. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, there is, and there is much more work to be done as we know. Lonnie, do you have any parting words for us? Well, if knowledge is power, a project like this will empower you. It will put you in a position where nothing will stop you. The group that I worked with, every time we meet each other, we're telling each other something about some, some history we found out. You know, I, I'm gonna really emphasize, and you don't know where you're gonna find it or how important it's going to be. You know, as I'm looking at my screen, there's a young uh, woman, Scarlett, and she's from uh, Worcester, Mass. And she said, homelands of the Nipmuc Nation. The United States Navy had a tug named the Nipmuc. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts, she doesn't know it. There's so much floating history out there of little things. And you take those little kernels and you bring them together with some other people, you're going to have quite a crop. So I'm going to tell you, uh, the group I worked with, Thank you very much. And if you don't think you can work with people and not get into an argument, get on a project like this because it's infectious. Everybody can have an idea. Everybody can have an opinion. And it actually works. It has bound us together, I think, for life. And what we have done, I think, is going to change the life of New London forever. So thank you, guys. Thanks uh, to everyone for watching. And it's possible, it's possible. Any town, any city, any community can do this. All you have to do is just start it. It's infectious. It'll take over and it'll run itself. Thank you, thank you, Lonnie, that's, that's very true. Uh, I just want uh, uh, some parting words here that uh, New London is a microcosm of America. The story of New London is the story of America. Uh, and thanks to the Black Heritage Trail, New London's history has finally begun to include the half that's never been told. This is real American history, complete, full, and unexpurgated. And I'm done. Uh, I do have some other slides if we have time, if people want to show, see some of the other sites that we didn't talk about. But I, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Emma. And if there are any questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen here. And uh, we'll uh, uh, try to answer any questions that anyone may have. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Tom. If you, anyone has questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. And I'll put them on the screen so that Tom and his team can see them. I think we wore everybody out. <laughs> okay. All right. Push back from donors. That's the question coming up on our screen now. Uh, what no. is that? Um, we have we have a question from Scarlett. I might be mispronouncing your name, so I'm not even going to try. Um, thank you, everyone. Best of luck with the launch next week. Thank you. Um, I hope Worcester can do something similar in the future too. I'll bet Worcester could. I'll bet you have a deep history in Worcester. Did I believe you Worcester was on the Underground Railroad. Talk to Aileen Novick, find her, uh, and we can put you in touch with her. Um, did you experience any pushback from donors or residents? We got one crappy comment on the day's article about it saying, when's there, of course, somebody had to say, is there, are there any plans for a white heritage, heritage trail? But that is the only negative comment that I have seen from anybody and even people who I have seen be um, kind of conservative to put it politely and comments um, on the newspaper site, they've been supportive. Um, we have, 
we have a city that really loves its history. And I think um, at this moment, at least, everybody wants to learn more facets of our history, regardless of um, race or ethnicity. But I think, I think there's a really deep interest right now in Black heritage and not just by our Black residents. I, I have seen a, a couple of comments that were directed towards uh, people who were not included in the 15 sites. And, and it's hard to answer that because we do have limits. And again, this is just the beginning, but there are they are both of them are stories that we had considered and talked about uh and but we had to choose 15. Uh, one was the first black police officer victor johnson in new london okay which we talked about we need to find we'd love to find a way to recognize him somehow and the other was the story of leo jackson who was the first black mayor in new england uh but but again one of the ways that we we covered that part of it was that Spencer Lancaster was the first elect black elected official in New London, and Spencer Lancaster made it possible for there to be a Leo Jackson about 20 years later. So, but that doesn't that's not to diminish any of that. There are many, many, many more stories. We could only tell 15. There are probably 15,000 just in New London that could be told. Uh, that may be a little high, but uh, if you go through uh, the book, uh, the uh, Black Roots in Southeastern Connecticut. It's a 600, 700 page book with stories of uh, j just listing names and connections and families and, and reading it. There's, there's no narrative in there. It's just uh, uh, names and, and the scant information that they have. But there are so many of them that are, are, are uh, amazing to read to think, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that. And look at the connections to one family to the other. That's how we found out. I mean, Ichabod Pease is in there. Uh, Adam Jackson is in there. And Adam Jackson's family is in there. Venture Smith is in there. Uh, many, many, many more stories uh, that still need to be told. And maybe this will be the, uh, the, the spark that, uh, that helps uh, future people or even some of us to write more about it and to, to develop more about it. It's a starting point. I, um, I would like to add one thing that we should definitely remember too. It's how something is presented to the powers that be. And Mr. Goodwin, presented it in a fashion that was acceptable. Because you can come with the info and be rejected. But somehow divine province, luck or what have you, uh, the standard bearer made a difference. I, I agree with you. And and, and I think it's it, there's also an element of it's an idea whose time has come. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and I look back at some of the stories that we didn't get to talk about that what you just said applies to uh, it applies to Ichabod Pease, because when he first came forward to, for his school, he was turned down. Uh, the city said, no, thanks. Uh, and he went back a second time and this time they uh, they uh, exceeded to his request. Same thing happened with uh, someone we haven't talked about here is Sarah Harris. Fairweather. Sarah Harris Fairweather was the first black student at Prudence Crandall School in Canterbury, Connecticut. And she approached Prudence Crandall to, uh, to be a student in the school and Prudence Crandall turned her down. And uh, she went back again and again and again. And then Prudence Crandall uh, uh, agreed to do it after she had been in touch with a number of other people and, and kind of came on board with that. So well, let's jump to living history. Sarah Cheney, the bank. Same thing. She had to come back with the help of Linwood Bland. It worked. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, it, and there are so many other stories that uh, I'm just thinking just the other plaques. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about Frederick Douglass coming to New London. Uh, he came to New London, gave four lectures. Three weeks later, Connecticut abolishes slavery. Uh, okay. And none of us knew that. We didn't know that story. Uh, I don't know that it was cause and effect. Maybe it was just the time, but uh, it's remarkable that, you know, nobody ever talked about Frederick Douglass being in New London. Uh, I will say that probably one of the reasons that people did not know that Sarah Harris Fairweather had lived in New London or that Frederick Douglass had lectured repeatedly in New London, four lectures in New London at Darts Hall, is that the house that the Fairweathers lived in no longer exists. Darts Hall no longer exists. 
And so when you do identify a site of cultural importance, and especially in what may have been a black neighborhood and underinvested in, that still exists, it's precious. I mean, not as precious as black elders, but precious because those sites embody the stories. And when the sites are gone, it's a lot harder to even stumble upon the stories. Can you tell that Laura is a historic preservationist? <laughs> That's You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And it makes me think about, I, I think what Curtis was just referring to, the story of, uh, and I know there is some activity going on in New London to talk further about the urban renewal and the, and the redevelopment program, because a lot of the buildings that you're talking about there, Laura, were located in that area and they've been paved over. Uh, there, you know, there's uh, other other construction on that site, and all that history. Uh, it's very hard to talk, including Ichabod Pease's school. Uh, that was located right right in that area too. The whole thing has changed, so it's really hard to to conceptualize. Uh, you know what it was like because it's right. out of sight, out of mind. The whole streets, whole streets are gone. Whole streets were bulldozed out of existence. I do want to say that records are important too, because in our office, we have appraisal forms from the urban renewal era, and they talk about how much the property owners are going to be um, compensated, what those properties are worth. A little detail that nobody at the time knew would be important, um, or that, that would resonate differently today than it did at the time. Those appraisal forms say in black and white that these are houses in minority neighborhoods and, that, and that's affecting property values. Um, and, and so um, when Curtis is talking about writing a wrong done to black property owners, we have, we have documentation of that wrong. That's right. That's right. Okay, I do see... I do see a question from Cam, our friend Tammy Denise. Uh, Tammy, yes, uh, give me a, a, I haven't actually written it up. I will have to you know, put it together and I will send you the steps that you were talking about in terms of trying to do that or adapt it to your community. Uh, and I see that Scarlett Huey also uh, makes a reference to PARGE, which is, I think that's how they pronounce the acronym, uh, yeah. which is Public Art for Racial Justice Education. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, program the uh i know they're doing a project in new london i live in nyanic and i know they're doing a project in nyanic and they're also doing one in norwich and i think in Lyme. and i think it's uh they're the, the part of it the basis of it is a connection with uh they all have a common connection with david ruggles okay the the famous freedom fighter uh founder of the committee of vigilance in new york he helped frederick douglas to freedom he helped get frederick douglas get married uh, he was born in Lyme. Uh, he moved, to, his family moved to Norwich. Uh, and, and the connection to New London is, and, and it's amazing. Every time we, we look into this, we find so many connections. We find that uh, it, one of the sites that we have on this plaque, on this tour, is uh, 73 Hempstead House. The first owner of that house was uh, John Parkhurst and his wife, Lavinia Ruggles Parkhurst. That's David Ruggles' sister. OK, They're, they were in New London. There were two Ruggle sisters that live in New London. So there's a potential for that Parge uh, 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 work to connect all of those towns in ways that they've never been connected before with, uh, with a very, very, very prominent, famous, uh, strong person uh, in, in the story of David Ruggles. Uh, it, it's amazing. So there's a lot. It's exciting to hear that they're doing that. Hey, Tom, I'll just add something really quickly. I'm an advisor for Parge, which is public art for racial justice. Yeah, I had started a New London urban art park initiative uh, just before they decided to come up with Parge. Um, so I was I was there from the inception. It's kind of like formed from one of my brainchilds, which was to add art to New London to make sure we paint murals. Um, they've taken it and just like this, it's blown it's blown up past my wildest dreams but i say that to say that next spring our mural here in new london will be up we're almost at fully funded which is great because instead of like the city paying it's the residents coming together and pooling money um to raise money in the state of connecticut just much like this project is going to match that grant so we're going to have quite a few murals up 
Um, also in the spring, you'll notice that our specific mural is going to coincide with the work that we've just done. So you'll notice illustrated on our mural, we'll have some of the stories of resilience that we've just shared in our uh, wow. black history. So um, some okay. exciting things happening and I'm just trying to work to, you know, uh, collaborate so that we can tell greater stories. And it's just great to be partnered with cities that, you know, aren't like us and that are a little bit more, um, prevalent in terms of their means, but for them to be able to reconcile racism and share their stories, it's just phenomenal to see this uh, work spread. Yes, I know there's an active group here in uh, in East Lyme uh, and uh, and also and also in New London. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the Norwich and the, and the Lyme ones, but it's uh, interesting to see. Uh, and I understand it's gonna be down near uh, Winter of our Net. first Our first wall is uh, Fulton Park. Fulton Park, yeah, down there Fulton on the on, on what we some of us the old timers still call the neck, Winthrop Neck, where the where the Fulton used to be, the subtender Fulton used to be. So that's that's a real interesting thing. Okay. Any other final comments or any uh, any other questions? Um can I just plug the site? Visit newlondon.org. That's where you can find out more about New London, our Black Heritage Tour. And please, I welcome you to the city. Um, hopefully one of us can give you a personalized tour. If you decide to come down, I'd be more than happy to. Visit newlondon.org. Okay. All right. Uh, Emma, I think uh, unless anybody has any other comments to make, I think uh, I think we're done here. And, and, and I want to thank you. Uh, for helping make all of this happen, that we could uh, share this story that we are all so proud of and so so pleased to be a part of, uh, every single one of us. And can't wait to have people come down and, and be able to share it with them. In person, maybe. <laughs> all right. Any other questions before we end the stream? All right. How much time and your whole team. Um, I really love training with you.